find, you can find guides back in the, in the front of the HCI there. Uh, I was a student here in, in 1960. Uh, that was before either H HCI had never been heard of, computer science had never been heard of. But what there was here was Perlis, Newell, and Simon who became legends of computer science. Uh, they were the people who started this whole thing. Uh, at the time, uh, Alan Perlis was a guy who believed that the most important thing for the world was to create tons and tons of software, and for that we needed to empower programmers everywhere. So he started inventing programming languages. Now, you might not believe me, but I think of programming languages as sort of being a human computer interface that requires you to think of programmers as being human. Uh, but so that was, the, that was sort of the beginning, in my mind, the beginning of the relationship between people and computers when people started designing programming languages. Now, Perlis, uh, aside from being a, a great innovator, was a guy who believed in doing everything by the seat of the pants, including managing the computer center and departments and everything like that, and including designing programming languages. As far as I can tell ever since, programming languages have been designed by the seat of the pants, not by any scientific method at all. Um, at the same time, by the way, uh, Newell and Simon, his partners in their pursuit of AI, also invented a programming language. Uh, that language was called uh, information processing language. And if you think that being a brilliant scientist enables you to design a programming language, think again. <laughs> that was if, probably the worst, most un human unfriendly programming language ever invented. We once asked Newell, um, well, why, why don't you, it does, it, well, here's how it worked. It was like assembly language, one command per line, and you could have any identifier you wanted to as long as it started with a letter followed by one or more numbers, uh, A through Z. We once asked Newell, well, why don't you even have mnemonic names for this? And Newell said, well, K298 is a really meaningful mnemonic to me. I think of K298 all the time. It represents the list of tasks or blah, blah, some, some AI thing. Uh, but anyway, so the history of programming languages has been they've never been designed scientifically. Um, later uh, in my undergraduate career, I was about to graduate, uh, I had a meeting with Herb Simon in which he tried to convince me to uh, become a graduate student in the new psychology department he was starting. Uh, I said, no, I'm going to go to MIT, and Simon didn't like that idea at all. But, uh, and I think, frankly, it was probably a mistake for me to do that. If I had gone and joined that psychology department, I, I might have been another Stuart Card. Not, was not to be. Uh, and anyway, by 1967, computer science was a thing, and Newell Simon and Perlis wrote something to Science Magazine defining computer science. And it's really a startling document, even if you read it today, because it said, oh, computer science is the study of all the phenomena surrounding computing. Now at the time, and even today, every computer science department in the country, except for the ones here, think that uh, computer science is about engineering, or it's a subform of engineering, maybe with a little bit of math. So that was a unique seed that was planted at CMU by <coughs> Newell and Simon, who were social scientists, what actually eventually gave rise to the uh, HCI Institute. Uh, so that's basically my story. Later on, when I was working at Xerox PARC, I, uh, Alan Newell was a consultant there, and he and Card and Moran were inventing HCI. Alan actually tried helping me with a project in which we were trying to design programming languages according to good psychological principles. So we worked on that a little bit without much success, I must say. Uh, finally, when I came back to Carnegie Mellon, uh, after doing various projects, uh, I knew called a meeting of about 50 of us. It was over in Wien Hall. He said, we, want, we need to have a human-computer interaction effort here at Carnegie Mellon, either in computer science or in psychology or somewhere. There were 50 or 60 people from all over campus tremendously enthusiastic about this, but nobody ever did anything. In fact, I sort of felt maybe I should do something, but in fact, I left the university and, and did, the, did that kind of a thing in a company we founded called Maya Design, uh, but uh, didn't do it here. Maya Design, actually driven by a guy named Pete Lucas, you know, blended together psychology and computer science using design from a real legitimate designer named Joe Belay, 
And that's really the first time I saw these three things put together. Uh, a few years later, I left from IN, came back to Carnegie Mellon, and Alan Newell had just died, so the first thing I said was on our agenda was to start an HCI effort, uh, which um, my partner in crime, Bonnie John, and I did. Um, so that's my short story. Uh, if, you any, if, you, if you ever have any questions, you can blurt them out before the end. Otherwise, we'll pass it on to Bonnie. Oh, <laughs> hi. I assume my mic is working. Uh, so I started life, my professional life, as a mechanical engineer working at Bell Laboratories. And I uh, went from mechanical engineering to systems engineering, where I was writing 500-page specifications for systems that would not see the light of day for half a decade. This is before Agile, OK? <laughs> um, but was I, when I was writing these specs, I said, is what I'm writing going to be easy for people to learn and use? And so I started taking psychology classes at night to find out. And I discovered that psychology was, um, as, as opposed to mechanical engineering, where I could predict how a machine was going to work because of things like gravity, OK, and theory of forces and stuff like that. There was no pr very little prediction in psychology. It was names and dates and experiments with their results. And I said, this is not the way you build a system. You've got to learn how to predict. And so I started thinking about how do I beat psychology into a form that engineers can use it. So I quit my high paying engineering job and came to Carnegie Mellon as a psychology graduate student, otherwise known as a slave, um, <laughs> in a program that was actually a PhD in the psychology department in human computer interaction. That program was in existence for two years. It had two uh, students before me and two students in my year. And then it died. So by the time we graduated, our degrees were in cognitive psychology. OK, but that, to my knowledge, was the first organizational effort to have human-computer interaction at Carnegie Mellon as an organization. And it didn't work. Um, there's lots of reasons why things don't work, OK? Um, and a lot of them have to do with the right people being in the right place with the right sensibilities and the same vision. Um, and if you don't have a critical mass of that, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, the next time, but then there are people who try again. And Newell was one of those. Alan tried again. He was my advisor, by the way. Um, he tried again, and, and Jim talked about these university-wide meetings. I think there was one or two of them. I clearly remember that man sitting next to me at one of them from design. Um, and those two meetings got a lot of excitement, and nothing happened. And then I was faculty in computer science, having a psychology degree, and doing this weird thing that they weren't really sure was computer science. And that was when Dwayne Adams went to DARPA. And he wrote the psychology faculty an open letter of what he thought was important for the future. And the two things he thought was important were software engineering and human-computer interaction. And we didn't have enough of that in computer science in his um, uh, in his estimation. And the, the software engineering stuff took off because of Mary Shaw and other people there. And this guy stepped forward and said, well, I don't have any credentials in HCI, but I'm willing to cha champion it. And you were a full professor, so you could take that risk. And, um, and that finally, that Dwayne's letter plus Alan's letter to us convinced the faculty to at least think about it. And then there was a white paper that Chris Newark and I worked on, and Jim and a couple other people, explaining why computer science wasn't enough to have really successful things in the world. Like we talked about um, expert systems in surgery, as I recall, one of the examples. We had two or three examples where you kind of have to understand what the people are doing as well as what the technology can do. And that didn't work either. The faculty voted it down. No HCI area in CS. <laughs> OK, so fine. The same people keep talking about it. That's OK. Remember, there's this organizational thing. It has to be the right place at the right time with the right people. And so the, the now fourth iteration proposal for this was to have an HCI institute. And a lot of things came together to have that happen. The beginning, we really cheated. We took faculty from lots of departments because we didn't have any faculty slots. 
we took courses from lots of departments because we didn't have any faculty to teach new courses. <laughs> so we had like three courses that were ours. And it eventually grew. But the things I got from that are one, new ideas, new, especially interdisciplinary things are going to fall between cracks. And you just have to keep finding the right crack for it to fall into. It's not going to work the first time, most likely. We might be very lucky. The second thing is you have to have the right people pushing for it. And I am looking at this panel and ashamed that there is no designer up here. So I am going to ask Dan to come up and take my seat. And I'm going to take that seat and put it up here. Come. You have to come. We didn't have this much trouble dragging designers into HCII. <laughs> Yeah, you're there. Okay. You better go. I'm, I'm supposed to go. Yeah. Um, oh wait. A we'll give we'll, we'll give you that. Your prepared what? comment. Yeah. Um, no, we'll we'll give you ten minutes to yeah. prepare. To, yeah. to, 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 to prepare and, what? Uh, any, uh, what uh, why you did HCI? Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, okay, well, I guess I'll go. Um, so I actually always was interested in HCI. I started as an undergrad at MIT in the 70s uh, doing HCI, uh, uh, which at the time was the Media Lab. They had a wonderful project program for undergrads to do research. And uh, CS students went over there and did research all the time. And that was a lot of fun. And then I got to do an internship at Xerox Park right at the height of when they were doing all the amazing things that hopefully everybody in the room knows about. Uh, so that was a really wonderful time. And uh, I graduated with a master's, did a visualization project, which was kind of HCI-ish at the time. And I got uh, snarfed into a startup company that one of the faculty at MIT was doing, which happened to be in Pittsburgh. Uh, it was a CMU spinoff. If you've heard of Sun Microsystems, it was a competitor to that. It uh, didn't last very long. Uh, but I got to do a window manager, which was a lot of fun. Um, and I actually was at CMU uh, at, during the SPICE project, which Rick Rashid uh, was in charge of. And he went on to be the founder of Microsoft Research. Uh, so we were doing that. Um, eventually, it was pretty obvious that the uh, startup was going to fail. And so I figured this was a good time to go off and get a PhD. And I looked around the world to find places where you could actually get a PhD in the early 80s, uh, which wasn't uh, very many choices. So I ended up at the University of Toronto uh, working with Bill Buxton and Ron Becker. And they actually had HCI courses available to take. Uh, my degree is actually in computer science because that was all you could do. But at least I got to do an HCI thesis and do uh, research. Uh, and then I was wondering where to go. It wasn't a lot of obvious places to go. And I specifically remember Mary Shaw calling me as a senior PhD student saying, oh, you have to come and interview at CMU. Uh, and I did. And my wife was very happy because she grew up here. Uh, so that's uh, how we ended up here in 87. I uh, taught courses in HCI occasionally. Uh, I was very fortunate that uh, Raj Reddy and a few other people had a bunch of money to do HCI, and uh, we had some DARPA projects that uh, the senior faculty helped us junior people um, collect. Uh, and uh, one of the things that really uh, kept me here all these years and kept uh, this program going is the really collaborative nature of the HCI Institute. Um, we've had, uh, you've heard from Bonnie and Jim some of the issues that uh, caused some of the other departments to be less friendly to some of our kinds of research. But within the HCI Institute, it's always been incredibly collaborative and friendly uh, and uh, collegial. And we uh, frequently co-advise students. We uh, try to collaborate independent of whether there are financial issues. Uh, if it makes sense research-wise or teaching-wise, then we just go ahead and do it without you know, worrying about the um, other kinds of things, that, institutional reasons why that might not be a good idea. Um, oh, there it is. Um, 
So it's always been um, a really uh, wonderful place to be. Uh, it's been so wonderful to have all of our PhD students go out and be tremendously impactful, and our master students as well. Uh, many of our uh, graduates from the PhD programs have gone off and founded HCI programs elsewhere, or the key people in the HCI programs around the world. And uh, we certainly are proud and uh, grateful that they have uh, continued to lead this area that we are so fortunate to be working in. Any questions? <laughs> hmm? uh, Ken Katinger. So uh, in, in 1984, I was in a PhD program at Wisconsin in computer science, interested in AI and, and how people learn, but kind of feeling like armchair AI was not the way to go, like just sitting at your desk thinking about intelligence wasn't going to get us there. And I, I started to slowly discover that there were actually people who studied how people are intelligent. Uh, and cognitive psychology with Newell and Simon and, and a bunch of other great folks here at CMU, both in psychology and computer science, seemed like a much better place to, to be studying. Uh, so I came in 86 uh, as a PhD student and then uh, started working in the Pittsburgh Public Schools uh, with, with an intelligent tutoring project for math. And, and I guess one thing that I kind of stumbled uh, upon at that point was maybe it'd be a good idea to understand the environment more deeply by participating in it. And, and I actually spent a few months teaching high school geometry as part of that project. I didn't know I was doing a contextual inquiry, and maybe <laughs> technically I wasn't really, but Real in, in, Real ethnography. Yeah, in yeah. some sense, Specific yeah, tutorial. that's what that. Uh, um, so I guess I was ripe for being in an environment where we brought those things together, uh, computer science and psychology in a sense for users. And, uh, and certainly um, as design became uh, more a part of it, uh, that was great. And I think, I guess the culture of the, of the place that Brad mentioned is a, is a super important lesson. But I, I, I do think another thing, I, I, we, we were talking about and thinking about like what would, what would you guys like to hear about our, besides us reminiscing about our history. Um, and one thought was, you know, HCI has been in these 25 years has become super successful, right? But in those early years, as I hope Bonnie's story already indicated, uh, you know, there was no sense that it was going to be. And there was a lot of pressure. Like, we felt a lot of, uh, like, what, do you guys think this is computer science, for <coughs> example? No way, right? Um, and as we were starting these programs, like the uh, MHCI program, are these folks going to get jobs, right, uh, when they go out? Well, we know now, right? <laughs> You all did, and you made it big. Yeah, so thank you for that. But I think there's the lesson there is like, you've got a new idea that's going to make a difference, stick to it. it it'll, it'll work if, if it's a great idea. Um, but going back to the culture issue, part of this was about appreciating that we could accept other disciplines. You know, psychology and computer science could live together. But then, uh, as designers, we're part of this too, you know, understanding like, I couldn't do what Dan did. I couldn't even fully appreciate and evaluate as we brought other designers in. So I very much remember Bonnie saying, like, let's ask Dan <laughs> and, uh, and, instead of just voting. And that was part of this very uh, collaborative culture that I think was really critical to, to creating a, a successful and lasting environment. Are you ready? Yeah. OK, I'm, that's a perfect jumping off point. Can, can you hear me? OK. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll jump right in there. Um, and I'll explain later how I got involved in this conversation. Um, the fact that there was this openness in these early discussions to say, what makes up a human computer interaction designer slash engineer? Um, and the fact that, yes, you were willing to ask questions of designers, not just of human behaviorists or computer scientists and so on. Because I think there was the understanding that if we're going to be designing, as was mentioned earlier, if we're going to be designing for people, we better un understand people. 
um, from various points of view. And since we were involved in very early interface work in the mid-'80s, um, after the Macintosh emerged, um, I began to realize designing a page of information and designing a screen of information had a lot of similarities. And we could bring that to the table and, and, and to the discussion. Um, the other thing that I think helped greatly was Dan Olson, whom you're going to hear from in a, in a few minutes, um, was acting director, was that correct? Dan? No, I was a director. You were, you were a director for... an actual, genuine director. You were an actual director. <laughs> Dan was visiting here for three years, was it? Two. Two years. Um, and he was, he was the direct, an early director of the HCI, and one thing that he did that I think was invaluable was to say to this group and other, a few other people, every Wednesday in my office, lunch. I'm, I'll buy lunch, I'll bring in sandwiches, I'll bring in pizza, Anybody who can make it, make it, and we'll, and we'll just talk. And what I learned in those two years was not just what each one brought to the table, but what, how ideas might and projects might begin to emerge because I'm talking to you or I'm talking to you, and we're thinking, well, well wait a minute, let's do something about that. And we did a few research projects. I mean, I still run across those, those papers um, that Dan did, and I had a grad student and so on. But the point was that there was a platform every week for two years for us to get together and just talk. And we didn't have to talk about HCI. We could talk about most anything. But eventually, it meandered back to relevant <coughs> topics. And I have tried to use variations of that method in building community, if you want to call it that, uh, a new organization, if you want to call it that. But, um, Boy, was that helpful. Um, I am proud of the fact that HCI does include design. I'm extremely proud that the current director is a designer um, from our program. Um, and I just think that this is still one of the most unique programs in the world and um, why it's such a success, not just in terms of the teaching, but in terms of the research that's, that's going on. And I'm sure that other people might discuss that, so I will pass it on. Okay, Bob Crowd. So, um, I'm Bob Crowd. I've been doing research on social computing, first in industry and then in academia, since 1981. I've been at Carnegie Mellon for 26 years and have been part of the HCI Institute since its existence. And I've been heavily involved in defining kind of our educational programs and building the institution. Um, and this experience, I think, gives me the privilege to reflect back a little bit about how the Institute has changed over that 25 years, um, and a little bit about how the discipline of HCI itself has changed. Um, I think during that time, the HCI as an organization went from being um, a mission-oriented, feisty, highly collaborative, but under-resourced startup like a startup company, to now a mature, successful, but bureaucratic organization. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I um, they, right they, they should have, they should have known that I'm a I'm glass half empty kind of guy <laughs> <laughs> when they invited me here. <laughs> Somebody had to channel that. So, yeah, he was always with us. <laughs> okay. Um, so along the way, um, getting from the startup to kind of an established academic uh, program. Um, we conducted groundbreaking research, educated generations of HCI practitioners in industry and professionals or professors in rival HCI programs. And we came a, a model for HCI programs in lots of other universities. But like, and like a business startup, although we didn't all have a kind of an office um, and bunks in Menlo Park or Palo Alto, um, we did have Dan's um, lunch table. We were um, a passionate bunch of faculty motivated by a shared vision 
that understanding the relationship between people and computing was essential for both building computer applications that met real needs um, and for understanding the impact that the rapidly spreading technologies would have on people's day-to-day -day lives. We certainly weren't the first people to think that HCI was an important topic. Um, Card Moran and Newell's um, kind of groundbreaking book was uh, um, 12 or 10 years before. 1983. The, yeah, before the HCI Institute. All of the major conferences, except for the design conference, um, had been in existence for um, 12 to 6 years before the founding of the HCI Institute. So the um, ACM conference on um, human, or computer human interaction, they didn't have the ordering right. Um, <laughs> um, but um, that was 1982, the first one of those. Um, what set us apart wasn't um, deciding that um, human-computer interaction was important, um, but it was to become the first academic department in the country to be devoted to the study and teaching of HCI. So it was institution building um, more than anything else. And for, I think, most of us up here and the founders, it was an exciting and heady time because we are creating something new. We had this collective vision and a passion about its importance. In the beginning, we were highly collaborative with um, people kind of from all around campus, Chris Newworth in the English department, Dan in um, design, um, Bobby Klatsky, who might be here in psychology, just lots of um, people from around campus. Um, Richard Chinas from philosophy, who's now the dean of the Dietrich College, um, got his start as an academic administrator by being uh, the director of our undergraduate program. So we were not only interdisciplinary, but cross-campus. We had ten, um, um, tentacles kind of all over the place. Um, and it was, a, as Bonnie mentioned, it was a struggle initially because our ambitions, especially to create quality education programs, were much greater than the resources that we had available to you. So we thought that, um, and we invested heavily in project-oriented courses because we thought those were very important. Um, but they take a lot of resources because you can't mass produce um, mentoring kind of students. So we cheated on the other stuff. For example, we had a, a, um, an external um, speaker series. We converted that into a class and required our master's students to take it. And I think that's still, and so we did it because we think having contact with these kind of visiting luminaries was important, but really because we couldn't teach um, what we committed <laughs> to teach any other way, um, except for piggybacking on these uh, visitors. Um, and as Bonnie said, since we couldn't teach our only, uh, we, could, we didn't have enough resources to teach our own courses, we outsourced many of them by um, pointing our students, or especially our PhD students, to existing courses elsewhere. Um, now, I don't want to come across as a uh, Nestor from the Iliad, bemoaning how life was more heroic in the old days. But, um, but, but it was. Yeah. <laughs> but, but sometimes I feel like that. It's inevitable as an organization gets um, larger, and its members are no longer creating something new, but are maintaining something that founders created and tweaking it to make it better, the esprit de corps um, is diminished. We became transformed into a more conventional academic department with less interdisciplinarity, less ties across the campus, um, with substantial divisions of labor, and with members m being more concerned about their own personal turf, either their educational turf or their research turf, um, than the department as a whole. I can, the metaphor I think of as we be we move from being a kibbutz to being a chamber, uh, to being um, a um, kind of chamber of commerce where everybody had their own little business and they got together in order to keep the streets clean. Um, um, to just give one example, um, while we had initially um, really strong integration between our research and teaching missions, so Bonnie, who's uh, kind of one of the founders of the field of HCI research was the um, 
early director of the master's program, kind of I, um, who was never an especially good teacher, was the first director of the program. But today these missions, the teaching and the research missions, I think have really gotten bifurcated. They've um, gotten separated. Um, um, and they're now largely carried out by different people located in different parts of the campus. So we have you know, five um, teaching-oriented faculty who do probably a better job than most of us who are researchers, primarily researchers, could do. But it means that there's this rift in the department, or at least this gap in the department between those two missions. Um, so although we may have gotten more professional and efficient, I think we now are two separate enterprises, a, a research and a teaching enterprise. Yet despite these misgivings, I'm immensely proud to have been one of the founding members of the HCII and to have helped shape it. Um, even though I'm now officially retired, I still am part of the department. I come in most every day. I advise students. I participate in lots of departmental affairs. And while CMU's model is, motto is my heart is in the work, for me, the motto is my heart is in the institute and the people in it. You know what, the, can you hear me? Yeah. You know what they say in Oklahoma, never follow a banjo act. I have a ukulele. I just uh, did not prepare anything. What I did bring was uh, an early document called Research on Computing Environments at Carnegie Mellon University. And this, uh, and you can see on the cover of this, but um, this was a committee headed by Alan Newell, and I was on the committee, Lee Sproul and Brad Walter, and it, it gives, uh, 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 gives thanks for advice to Michael Cohen, Douglas Van Howling, Rob Kling, Mark Lepper, James March, James Morris, Jane Siegel, and Bob Sproul, and it says, also, we are grateful for the editorial suggestions provided by Gaynell Green, who happens to be my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, this was uh, 1983, and I thought I would just uh, sort of anchor my comments around that year. I'm, some of you were not born then. Um, <laughs> and uh, things were very different. So I ended up at Carnegie Mellon um, because of uh, who I knew and relationships and experiences. Uh, I happened to be working at the National Academy of Sciences for f uh, about three or four years, um, having come from the University of Kansas, and I was in Washington working at the Academy, and I ended up working for Herb Simon. And Herb and I worked together for a year for an Academy study of research uh, in the social and behavioral sciences and psychology. And um, after I worked for him, uh, he said, why don't you come to CMU, which I had never heard of. And <laughs> uh, at the time, he said, uh, you know, it's a great place. And I remember visiting uh, with my husband uh, in January. And I thought, oh my god. <laughs> I'll last here for three years. That's it. <laughs> And, uh, but, you know, it, just the idea of, of being in the same uh, institution as Herb uh, and, and the other people I met here uh, was just a wonderful thing. And I remember I, I missed my plane for my job talk because um, I was so nervous I couldn't even pack and <laughs> um, eventually made it and, and uh, ended up here. So uh, that was 1979. 80, year of 80, and at that time, the only computing I knew about was the computing I had to do to get my dissertation done, and, uh, you know, Fortran and all that stuff, and <laughs> uh, I didn't know anything about HCI. Um, I didn't know about the psych department program or anything, but in 1983, um, I started noticing, and, and I'm a 
trained as a social psychologist, so I, I started noticing that uh, people were sending messages through the computing system, and they were mostly, uh, I guess, what we'd call chat now or, or text texting, and uh, that their behavior was quite strange. And so I decided to run some some experiments. Um, and so the first experiments uh, I ran with some students. Um, we had, you know, one, one the control group was making decisions face to face and the other group was doing it on the computer and uh, they couldn't come to decision. They were getting angry at each other and in one session I had to call the, the police because uh, <laughs> these students were, were just so angry at each other because they wouldn't accept each other's ideas. So that got me started on wondering about what it was like to work in a, in a computer-intensive environment. And I um, went to, I had no money, no grant money at the time to do this kind of work, so I, I told the, the story to uh, Alan Newell, and he said, oh, you know, that happens all the time. Uh, <laughs> and he gave me uh, $10,000 out of, I believe, Raj Reddy's budget. <laughs> to start work, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I got invited by the Robotics Institute at the time to have an appointment, so I ended up spending time uh, across campus um, with all the computer science robotics types, and, um, you know, really got intrigued by all that, and so that, that started off a completely new new career, um, and uh, I got so involved in, in understanding the implications of computing and the different kinds of online behavior that I ended up going for a year to the, a little company called Interval at, in California, and uh, I decided I, I couldn't, uh, I, I didn't want to stay in the social sciences uh, department, so I went on the job market, and then um, uh, I think it was uh, Bob Kraut and, and Jim Morris and, and some others who decided to uh, offer me a job at the HCI, and that was, uh, I believe, about 1989. And uh, I'll never forget uh, getting an email that Jim Morris sent to about 30 people uh, where the subject line said, confidential. <laughs> Sarah Kiesler's appointment. <laughs> and it just struck me that uh, when you put something online, nothing was confidential. <laughs> uh, that was just one of many, many wonderful um, experiences I had uh, <laughs> coming here. And uh, I, I see some of my former students in, in the audience here, that's great, and uh, colleagues. And, and one, one of the parts of the culture here, which I don't think has ended, um, and by the way, Bob, uh, so I work at the National Science Foundation now, and he doesn't know anything about bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so one of the things I do notice, and it's still around, and is the collaboration that happens when people co-author papers and work together in teams and, and form new projects that are interdisciplinary. And, and I do hope NSF has encouraged interdisciplinary work and collaborations across faculty and students in different parts of campus, and I think, uh, and even across different universities and schools and nonprofits and community organizations and schools, and, and that is, is going to continue. And uh, th this place does it really in an in a incredibly sterling way. It's admired, I know, all across the, the foundation for, you know, it's the CMU way. So that's my story. Well, you get to keep the mic. So I was, I was a, a latecomer to this. Um, 
I have been trained in computer science. Uh, I've read all of Mary's papers, at least up until the 90s when I turned and became a HCI person. Um, I was trained as a compiler construction person. In fact, it wasn't until I went to grad school that um, I came into the Moore School at the University of Pennsylvania and I said, I'm here, I'm a new PhD student, I know compilers and I know computer graphics. And they said, well, all the compiler people went to a conference and the computer graphics guy is down in the basement, go talk to him. <laughs> okay, so I went and talked to Norm and Norm said, you know, I think we got this graphics thing nailed. I mean, this was bubble man, he had it nailed. Um, but these user interfaces are so hard to write. I spend so much time building menus and things. And it was one of those moments I sat there and looked at him and said, it's just a programming language problem with a different token set. I can build that. He says, okay. And so that's what I did my dissertation on. And I got into the HCI community quite by accident. Um, and I had been a pretty serious technologist. We founded the WIST conference, and I knew, I knew Brad, and I knew Scott. And we worked, we were heavy techies. I still bleed code if I get cut. Um, and one day, WIST was in Pittsburgh. And Brad said, you know, we've got this Human Computer Interaction Institute going, and we're hunting for a director, and if you've got some time this afternoon, would you come interview? <laughs> Now, this violates any uh -huh. number of diversity and fair hiring <laughs> practices that you could have. <laughs> Would you come in this afternoon and interview? Sure. Where I grew up, HCI was like the premier of computer science. This was like the holy grail. I'll love, gladly go talk to the CMU computer scientists. Well, it came out, they said, you know, we know you've been a department chair and we'd like to offer you this job. I went home, told my wife, and she said, Pittsburgh, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> but she loves me, which is a good thing. <laughs> my kids, on the other hand, it was still, when we moved here, they all said, we'll never have another friend ever in our life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and at the time, we had eight kids. And, so, and I said, it'll be OK. And when we left Pittsburgh, they said, you can't leave Pittsburgh. We'll never have another friend ever <laughs> in our life. They got over it. But when I came here, I want to I wanted share with you three stories that were really tell a lot to me about what it means to be at CMU. So the first one was, when I first got here, I said, OK, I have to be director of this institute. I have to figure out what everybody does. And Bob and Sarah had just finished a study on how people use the internet. Social science, I mean, you know, I like them. I talk to them at parties. Um, and so I went to listen, and Bob and Sarah started to describe to me that, yes, we know teenage boys love the internet, but did you also know that middle-aged women that live at home love the internet? No. Why? I'm really good at that. Why? And they proceeded to explain to me what they had learned about how people use this thing. And the insight, it was just an insight to me, this is, wait a minute, I've been building this technology all of my adult life. And I've never seriously asked the question, why do people want to do this? And how does it make a difference in their life? And sitting and listening to Bob and Sarah describe what they'd done was just an epiphany for me. And I went, this is cool. People matter. I always knew people mattered. They were a test load for the operating system. <laughs> How people felt and what they did actually mattered to the technology. Now, about a week later, Bonnie comes popping into my office, because Bonnie likes to do that. She comes into my office and says, Dan, Dan, you've got to come see Jody Forlisi's master's defense. She's one of our students, and she's defending her master's degree in design. I like designers. I talk to them at parties. <laughs> and so she took me in there, and I sat down, and I'm sitting next to Bonnie, and I'm being very polite and social. And, and Jody stands up, and she says, I want to give you all a sense of Africa. 
Bonnie, what have you done to me, and what has this got to do with computer science? And for the next hour, Jody explained how thinking about Africa and its culture and its people and the things they did on a daily basis, and then she led us to a point where she showed, and I, I'm sure she still got it in her office, she showed us the Africa stick. And I said, I have just listened to somebody explain to me a completely different way of deciding what an important technology is. And I says, I want to see how the Africa stick works. Ah, uh, it didn't. It had pictures pasted on it. That was the other thing I had to learn about design. She had imagined a way of using a computer in an extremely human way that I had never conceived of. Never conceived of it. Well, one of the things I did is, yes, we had the lunches. And I have to give credit to the lunch idea. That's actually Raj Reddy. Uh, because, yes, we had our Wednesday lunch. But I had a Tuesday lunch in Raj's office, which I thought was very cool. <laughs> because we all got together and we talked about techie stuff. <laughs> and what the college ought to do and where it ought to go. Those two experiences changed for me what it meant to do computer science. Because I had always known and always believed at the end of the day, computers don't buy product. Computers don't use product. The only thing that really matters is the human beings in this world and how we serve them. And I had had two sets of people from very different disciplines explain to me how to better use the technology I loved to serve the human beings that I felt were so important. And that was, just, that, was a, that was an epiphany for me. And like Dan Boyarsky, I loved Wednesday lunch. I loved Wednesday lunch because of all the things that I learned. In fact, when I first got a little bit of funding, I funded one of Dan's students. I bribed Dan and his student to come and meet with me every week for almost the two years. We wrote papers together. And I would explain technical problems, and they would show me how designers would invent solutions to them. I loved it. I loved it. Now, another experience that is really important about CMU being, and I want to reinforce that interdisciplinary nature so much, uh, one of the things I'd like to, you to think about is, if you think about geology, in the middle of the tectonic plates, nothing interesting happens. It all happens where they rub together. So as you're looking for where I'm going to go in my career, and if you think you settled down in the middle of HDI, HCI, or computer science, or psychology, shame on you. The cool stuff is at the boundaries. It's where new things rub against each other in ways that they never did before. Now, when I got here, as the director, one of the things I had to do is create an institute out of a collection of cats scattered all over the university. And so I said, well, the first thing we can do is we can create a catalog where you can go to one place and find all the HCI courses, because they were listed everywhere. And so I sent Marion, I'm, I'm really sad Marion's not here today. I sent Marion out and says, Marion, go find out what the procedural process is to rename and assemble courses on campus. She comes back to me and she says, you go talk to this guy in the computer center and he'll take care of it. Well, I've been at academic institutions and nothing works like that. <laughs> I said, Marion, go out and find me what the committees are that I have to talk to, that I have to pitch, and I have to get approval. She comes back and she says, you go talk to the guy in the computer center. <laughs> all right. So I went to Raj, who was the dean. I says, Raj, I want to bring all these courses together. And I can't get anybody to tell me who I talk to to make this happen. And I, he says, you go talk to this guy in the computer center, and he'll take care of you. And I says, Raj, where's the administrative committees? And he looked at me, and he said, if we didn't believe that you were world class good at what you do, we never would have hired you. And because we believe that, we will never put a process in your way to get the job done. I knew I liked this place. <laughs> I knew I liked this place. Because we would get together at lunch, and we would conceive of what we wanted to do, and we would just go do it. And people like Jim Morris and Raj Reddy would back us up. 
And people like Mary Shaw, when we got in committees, would back us up and fly air cover for us and allow us to do new things that had never been done before. Now, I have to echo something that Bob said, and that is, in the world, there are pioneers and there are settlers. And they have a very different view of the world. And many of you, having received your degrees <coughs> from this institution, have the danger of becoming settlers. HCI is the way it is. No, it isn't. HCI is the way we made it. And we invented it. And we just made it up as we were going along. Start making it up and quit worrying about satisfying what we created. Because the fun stuff is at the boundaries, and the fun stuff is in what's new, and CMU is an intensely exciting place to do that. And it was a fun two years to be here. Um, response or, or another support for the last lesson that you just said. Um, I was the head of the master's program for, I don't know, a dozen years, 16 years, something like that. And I was the only person who had to say whether a course fit our educational requirements or not. And so I would um, allow, not allow, you know, uh, like a computer scientist who had never opened their eyes to the world would come and say, I, I don't know what to take. And I would say, take a freshman photography class. I don't think there's any other university in the world where that would give master's credit for a freshman class. But this was literally eye-opening for a computer scientist. OK, same with a designer coming in. I don't know how to program. Well, you can't throw them into a graduate level programming class, but you can give them a uh, an undergraduate programming class and give them master's credit for it. I always had a little write-up about why this was important, just in case the university ever came and said, why are you doing this? Nobody ever asked me. So that same philosophy that, that um, Dan was talking about extended to so many things. We could do what was right because people trusted us that we were doing what was right. And so I'm hoping that Bob's pronouncement doesn't take that away. No innovation ever came from a policy or a procedure. Dan. Well, OK, I'm the third Dan. Dan. <laughs> I don't know if it's the fourth one in the pipeline or not. I came about it uh, very circuitously. Uh, I was a grad student at Stanford back in the times where things were a bit of turmoil. Matter of fact, one of my favorite artifacts on my uh, shelf is a piece of a Spanish tile that used to belong to the roof of the Stanford president before the bomb went off. And I come to CMU uh, right after Kent State, very placid, everybody uh, nose to the grindstone, heart was in the work, very different attitude compared to Silicon Valley at the time. Well, anyway, uh, rapid decision making was uh, impressive to me, too. I came and interviewed. I never gave a talk. Uh, I only had 10% of my thesis research done. And I got back to California, and 7 o'clock the next morning, I was offered a job. And so being able to make those quick decisions, uh, especially through my early career, made an impression on me and the way I did my work. Uh, but I was taking, uh, at Stanford, I was taking electrical engineering, and I had a minor in computer science, and I really liked the, you know, some of the luminaries there, and John McCarthy teaching me Lisp, uh, Alan Kay teaching me compilers, very forward-thinking people, and I liked the top-down approach. Of course, engineers are bottom-up, and so I liked the com combination of the two because sometimes bottom-up thinking is the way to go, and other times it's top-down. So I came here, and they offered me a joint appointment in electrical engineering and computer science. Not only were there two different departments, there were two different colleges. And nobody I knew at Stanford who had a joint appointment got promoted. And everybody said, never do a joint appointment. It's, it's a death. And, but joint appointments worked even before I got here, almost 50 years ago. 
And CMU knew how to make those cross-disciplinary things work. So that was intriguing to me. So anyway, I spent the first maybe 20 years here doing uh, engineering type of design, designing multiprocessors, designing chips, doing software to synthesize new computers and so forth. And coming in about the uh, 1980s, we had a system that you could actually specify a computer, uh, what instruction set, how much memory, what clock speed, what you want to pay for, what's the reliability, what's the board area, and so forth. And we would synthesize the design in less than 10 minutes. So we wanted to figure out how to demonstrate this. So what we did is we actually synthesized the board, and we needed uh, somehow to house it and get that extra uh, dimension in. So I had actually taken on one of our previous boards, an uh, electrical engineering student told them, design a housing for it. And it turns out that we were doing the first uh, generation 3D printing, about 1989. And so he built something that looked like a bridge. Well, most engineers, what they know about structural things, they're, they're taught bridges and statics and dynamics. And the, but I knew I needed help because there's a reset button. In order to reach the reset button, you had to put your finger through the fan. <laughs> so I went to, Anthor, I, I went to uh, Dick Buchanan and I said, do you have some undergraduates in design that could, could help? So we had somebody named Chris Kasabak came over and he uh, uh, got us started on our first wearable computer and then uh, he was moving away on a Watson Fellowship to spend two years designing toys in Africa. And we asked him, do you have somebody else he could suggest? So he suggested his soccer playing teammate, John Stavoric, who later with Chris started Body Media and then they bought by Jawbones and uh, now uh, John Stavoric's uh, high up in Google. But anyway, so they brought a totally different dimension to things. As a matter of fact, it was really great because the engineers uh, would try to fit the electronics into the shapes that uh, they had created. And for a while there, we actually were one of the best international design houses. They actually uh, submitted uh, designs to comp uh, competitions and were winning uh, these competitions. And it's kind of interesting because the juries totally missed it. They said, well, it looks almost good enough to work. Well, we had the systems in the field out in California doing maintenance on, on uh, marine amphibious tractors. So it was really getting this technology out to the world in the meantime, they were teaching Alcoa how to add colors to their 3D printers and get usable plastics. So it was a really uh, creative, inventive time. And uh, then I was uh, director of the Engineering Design Research Center, which was an NSF center looking at design across the curriculum. And uh, we graduated that center, and uh, Randy Pausch comes up to me. And I had watched Randy, and I watched a formation at HCII as a computer science uh, faculty member. And uh, so I was uh, asking Randy, I saw him, uh, his hiring talk and so forth. He comes to me and says, how would you like to be director of HCII? And I said, well, that sounds intriguing. I never thought of it. You know, it's a chance to learn a whole bunch of other things, not only design, but social science and so forth. And uh, so I said, Randy, but you're the obvious guy. Why not you? He said, well, we've had a uh, search committee because somebody only wanted to stay two years. And <laughs> it failed. And uh, it's the second time around. The search committee says, you, Randy, need to find somebody. Otherwise, you, you're going to be it. And I, Randy, <laughs> don't want to be director. <laughs> and I said, oh, OK, that sounds interesting. So I went around and talked to the senior faculty at the time to see if they would accept me. And so I took it on as sort of a, a new challenge. We continued the Tuesday lunches. That's where I learned a lot the first, the first two years from the other disciplines because I didn't know anything about them and I needed to know something about the, how to govern them. So in some sense, I got the job of growing from our original core. The original core was really very hard working. Uh, they were doing things. I think Brad Myers is still uh, seminar chairman for uh, several decades. Bonnie was running uh, running the, uh, the master's program in addition to the courses she was teaching. And everybody was really putting up over and beyond because we didn't have the facilities and the, uh, the budgets to do things. 
I just want to add one little footnote uh, before I forget it. Uh, I happened to come in January, and my fiance at the time, the closest place she had lived before uh, coming to Pittsburgh was Palo Alto. <laughs> and he said, you're going where? But later on talking to Noel Newell, and that, I think Alan Newell came to Pittsburgh in January. So I think it would be very interesting demographics to find out how many people actually started their careers in Pittsburgh in January. <laughs> and so it allows us to focus on our work instead of <laughs> other things. Uh, but we, we grew the program, so I wanted to do two little examples of things we had to do uh, in, in your fl fluid uh, world. So first thing is uh, space. Everybody talks about space. <laughs> and so we had outgrow in our space. We were in a first floor wean hall. Anybody who's been down there, you know how small that is. And uh, even when we opened up the uh, little Simon Hall, we immediately filled it up. So there's a, a building on Craig Street that was coming uh, into CMU's uh, uh, governance. And we went off and we tried to uh, see if we could talk to provost into giving us that space. Now, it turns out there's a four floors building. First floor <coughs> went to the police office as well as a uh, commercial uh, subway type of sandwich shop. So that gave us three floors, which would have doubled our space. So there was a big discussion about do we move off campus or not? And that was off campus. And of course, any place that you go to school, that, you know, that Craig Street's not that far. It not, would not be considered off campus. But that was a, a big uh, concern because of all the connections we had with campus. And, uh, but it would have given us double the space. Well, before I could make a decision, we, even with our rapid decision process, uh, the provost had promised the top floor to the comp uh, supercomputing center. Okay, so it's not quite as attractive. And then the next time I turned around, half of the second floor got t given away. So now we're at equal space. And so, but we need some extra, anyway, we went with software engineering, did a master's program, and Bonnie designed uh, expert uh, uh, layout so that the project groups could coexist. Uh, and we're still using that model today. And uh, uh, so we're able to uh, grow our space uh, that way. But uh, it's the other uh, interesting thing is growing the budget. Space, uh, space and money are bo bo basically the only two things department heads have to worry about. <laughs> so fortunately, I had connections with uh, electrical computer engineering, which had just started a program, a PhD program with Portugal. And Portugal uh, was very interested in upgrading to international standards. And since Jose Mora knew me, one of the universities in Madeira in Portugal wanted to do a master's program in HCI. So it turns out we were able to get it through to the Portuguese. You talk about uh, bureaucracy, there's, that's another thing, the European bureaucracy. Uh, but uh, so that actually gave us extra income so we could hire professional staff to spend full time and free up the faculty from the double duty that they were doing. So that was really good. So one final anecdote I want to leave you with is we talked about the ability of doing things, and Dan was talking about seeing the guy in the basement that could change the course title. Well, we I went to Dan Boyarski and said, okay, we got money now, we want to hire design. We want to hire faculty design, who should you suggest? And he suggested J Jody. So, so then I took, uh, we offered Jody a job, and then I went to the dean of computer science at the time, school of computer science, it was Randy Bryant, and I said, Okay, I've got somebody who's got a terminal degree, a Master of Fine Arts. How do I get her promoted to a full professor in the School of Computer Science? And he made a very simple thing. He says, well, to find the yardstick, how are you going to measure her? And then tell me where she is on that yardstick. And I can go to any number of famous people at CMU. Brad Whitaker is another one in robotics and so forth. His yardstick was the robots he built. So CMU was not stuck with the normal bean counting uh, yardstick. Uh, if you're going to make an impact on the world, tell us how you're going to do it, and tell us how you, your progress is. And to this day, that's why it makes it so exciting for me to continue my relationship with uh, ACII and com com Carnegie Mellon. Uh, 
okay, we have a few more minutes, uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Um, you've, been hearing, you've been hearing from this group a lot about the way it used to be. Uh, and frankly, I'm curious, and I think my, my, we, you, these people here are probably also curious, they would like to know what it's like for you uh, and what questions you might want to ask us. After all, there's 800 years of HCI wisdom, <laughs> 200, 200, 200 years of HCI wisdom sitting here before you. So even though we used, we've, we've told you about, we've told you about all of our problems we've solved. Maybe you could ask us about what problems you have, and we'll tell you how to solve. <laughs> Uh, so I'm an alumni that just graduated in May with a major in global studies, a minor in entrepreneurship, minor intelligent environments. So I'm one of those interdisciplinary in the people in the fringes, always trying to push people to create new things and push them out of their comfort zones. So I guess the one thing I just wanted to go back to, you know, maintaining an ecosystem versus, you know, creating something new. What do you think are like the three things we as the new generation should push forward in, you know, developing artificial intelligence and developing, you know, you know, this autonomous world around us. Thank you. So one of, the, one of the keys I always use, and part of it I acquired here, and part of it was just the way I grew up. The question I would always ask is, who do I serve? If I do what I do, whose life is going to be better? And how will I make that better? And if you keep chasing that kind of a problem, you will always have exciting, fun, interesting things to do. Other answers, Dan? I'll, I'll, I'll try this. I'm not sure I'm, I'm going to answer the question, but I remember many years ago, early in my tenure in the School of Design, one of my colleagues said, you know, Dan, if, if I keep this, giving the same project each year and I would start off by saying, okay, we're going to be designing a chair, immediately in everyone's heads will be an image, a variation on what we know of as a chair. And that's not going to be very helpful in terms of preparing students to solve new problems in the future. But he said, if I present the problem as this will be um, an artifact that will hold someone's weight um, in a number of positions um, and that, that type of thing, then you may end up with solutions that don't necessarily look like chairs. They may solve the problem, but they not, may not be with chairs. And what I was struck with with your question was, and, and again, I, I'm I don't hear very well anymore. Um, if you start saying, if you start a project by saying, we're going to build a website, I'm going to go back to Dan's point. How do you know that the website's the answer? Start with what the problem really is in the context of people, in the context of something to do, solving a problem, and then let the solution emerge naturally. So another uh, perspective or way to think about it is the uh, nat most natural way for people to interact is uh, full of errors, full of ambiguities, full of uh, corrections and iterations, and which is exactly the opposite of virtually all ways people think about AI systems. So uh, approaching it from the perspective of assuming it'll be an interaction, not just a one-shot answer, question answer, Assume it'll be full of errors. How are you going to deal with errors and corrections? So having a much more human-centered, more natural approach to it will reveal a whole different set of uh, methods and requirements. Yeah, and my answer would be, uh, so I'm a social psychologist, so I would say pizza. Um, that is um, getting a bunch of people who um, have some relevant knowledge about the problems that you've identified and giving them a social environment where they can um, have lunch in Dan's office, that is, have lots of informal conversation um, where they're not necessarily task-driven from the beginning, where new ideas can um, bubble up from the um, creative friction of people who are different from each other talking to each other in an unconstrained environment. Okay. 
Other question. Hi. Wow, all of this accumulated expertise, wisdom, and humor on stage. Can you tell me where HCI almost went, what it almost used to be called? Um, you know, it is a discipline right now, which I know now that I'm teaching in uh, the field of design, and that is, that is so broad. I, I really appreciate some of the disciplinary boundaries that have been created in the field of HCI, but it sometimes seems like things were really arbitrary and they could have gone in this direction or that direction. Um, so I'm just curious where things might have gone and will we still call this HCI in the future? Uh, we've gone through so many buzzwords. I mean, uh, when I got into HCI, it was because I was getting a master's in human factors. Okay, but they didn't like human factors just being another offshoot of that because human factors was viewed, those people were the nags. Those were the people who told the engineers they were wrong. They were wrong. It failed. People couldn't use it. They were wrong. They came in afterwards and did evaluations and discovered it was wrong. Okay, and so we had to have a new name because we didn't want to just be human factors. And if you want to actually read about that, the, the paper that uh, Card and Newell wrote after the, what was it, 85 CHI conference where Newell gave a talk, came an HCI journal paper out of that, um, I can't remember the name of it, but the, the, the upshot was you can't just be a nag like human factors, design is where the action is. And so all our theory, all our experience has to be translated into actually being the upfront design Otherwise, we will fail as a field. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that was HCI, because it was in the HCI journal. Or maybe it was CHI, because it was first a talk at the CHI conference. But it wasn't even factors. Okay? And then HCI is too small, because it's human, human computer interactions, computer supported cooperative work, user experience, because getting broader, getting broader. I can't tell you what it's going to be next, but I bet in five years it won't even be UX. Yeah, one thought in that regard is, uh, and I think somewhat goes back to Dan's abstraction of the fundamental problem. And uh, maybe Brad also said, ultimately what's most important is the interaction. Like, maybe that's what we should be, interaction. It's the name of our journal, or magazine, <laughs> yeah, anyway. Magazine. Yeah, that's true. right. And that opens the door. I mean, we're already seeing, you know, is it computer or is it human? Human interaction, is it human coffee pot interaction? I don't know if that's a, right, a computer. Yeah, but absolutely. yeah, Fundamental fundamentally, the, yeah. the sort of the theory and the design are about uh, making that interaction be powerful. So, so one of the things to me is that, you know, will HCI always be HCI? Probably not. Um, I believe the human will always remain because at the end of the day, the humans are actually what matter. Um, if you talk to most people today, and you say, do you spend a lot of time on your computer? They will say, no, I spend it on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to people? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> There's a computer in there, really. Yeah. <laughs> so that technology, the shape of the technology, it's gonna change, it's gonna change a lot. The things we can put a computer into, it's gonna change a lot. People? No. But people are what's exciting. And will there always be an interaction? If you're on the edge, there's always interaction. It's only in the middle of the plates that there's no interaction. So I, I just want to add to that. Maybe it's a quarrel, but I remember uh, the first thing that Bonnie always taught in her classes was the user is not me. <laughs> yeah? Uh, so I think what I see now is that our social world is changing. The people using computers are changing. The dem demographics of uh, our country and of many other countries are changing. And uh, I think one thing that's going to have to change is designing uh, computing devices or 
even they may not be devices, they could be intelligence systems or whatever, uh, will have to work for the uh, people who are now somewhat invisible in the, in the HCI domain um, for the, uh, populations who are special in some way, for disabled people, for people who are poor, for uh, people who are in rural areas who barely get broadband now. So I, I do think there are a lot of problems out there that we need to push um, the field to so solve. So uh, one quick addendum. I think one of the things that we can be proud of in HCI is the breadth and the way we've adapted. Uh, most other areas don't have a central conference that everybody in the area calls home. I do a lot of work with software engineers, and you would think that the main software engineering conference would be where they all go, but it's not. So we all really are still attached to CHI, and the technologists are all really attached to UIST. And these conferences have dramatically changed in the content and form in ways to try and uh, retain a big tent, uh, to retain really exciting novel uh, aspects. And so I think that's one of the ways that we've been able to stay quite relevant as a discipline while still changing dramatically. Hi. Um, so I'm currently in design strategy, and I'm always trying to figure out how do I get at the right insights or figuring out certain frameworks to understand more about the user. Um, and so I just want to ask, in, in your experience, what is there a resource that you personally uh, recommend or you know, some subscription or something that helps you sort of develop this way of getting into insights, like learning new frameworks or techniques? I, I tend to use humanity. <coughs> um, Could you clarify? <laughs> <laughs> if, if I want a new insight, li literally, I will go find a new place or a new thing, and I will just sit and watch what people do. Um, and finding a new context and just watching what they do, uh, frequently the ideas I get will be completely unrelated. But I find humanity the most inspiring of all. What do people do? What do they need? How are they suffering? What are they struggling? Why did they come here? Why did all those people stay away? Uh, if you just sit and watch people and ask yourself questions about them and then write notes, you'll come home with notebooks full of interesting ideas and insights of things you could do. Ask good questions, ask others. When you said people, I was thinking more like asking the people around you. That's, that's another no, they're, part they're like, of the people. You guys are you, like me. I want to ask real people. Yeah, yeah. No, I, <laughs> I, I'm all for watching what others do, but, but I think even when you're doing that, the questions you bring to the observations are critical in terms of what you see. So having good questions, asking them while you're observing, asking them of your others, maybe even asking them on Google, um, put all those three things together and, and maybe that's your strategy. I'll tell you what Herb Simon told me. He said, uh, Sarah, you need to read Science Magazine. All of it. All of it. <laughs> and he did. He, he read it, cover to cover. No more questions? Yeah, uh, that's what, since we're in Noel Simon Hall, what Noel always told me was, because he always had billions of fabulous ideas. He said, where did these ideas come from? He says, I think it's because I read a lot and then forget that I read it. <laughs> so that, it's very similar. They guys work together in the buildings for them. Maybe we should remember what they told us to do. <laughs> okay, that's a great closing comment. Thank you for your attention. If you want the 